what is property? And the reason I'm talking about this tonight is because the majority report with Sam Cedar had a brief video, which I will play discussing the property question that uh, sparked my my uh, my impulse to continue that conversation. OK, let me pull that up here. What it means to own something in this country is who has the greatest claim to the state's monopoly of power or violent authority. And, and you, you talk about propertarianism. What, what is that uh, term? That uh, that is a term I, I stole from Ursula K. Le Guin um, in the, the novel The Dispossessed, uh, just kind of like the sound of it. Uh, Thomas Piketty has a similar word, prop, uh, proprietarianism, but I, I like mine better or well, Ursula K. Le Guin's. But the, the idea there is that, you know, this is about, um, you know, as as Piketty says, the, the sacralization of property, treating property as a sort of sacred object that can't be, you know, fiddled with that, that like, uh, you know, has to be the sort of foundation stone of the entire social order. Um, you know, obviously appealing idea for rich people who own lots of property. Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, property is almost the most interesting part to sort of dig into the socially constructed nature of all economies, because, I mean, you think about it, you know, at, at a certain point, a certain, surely, you know, in like prehistory or before human beings even existed, there was no property at all. Like the, the, uh, the, anyone was free to go wherever they wanted. Um, and, you know, at least, <laughs> I mean, you might be eaten by a jaguar or something, but you didn't, uh, you know, there wasn't a sort of system of, of fences that would tell you that this piece of ground is mine, that piece of ground is yours, you know, that these were invented. Um, and, you know, you think like everything in the world, all the objects, all of the pieces of computer equipment and stuff that we're using to talk to each other right now, all that is made out of natural stuff that, uh, you know, once was not, not the property of anybody who had to be dug up out of the ground. You know, it was created in the uh, a supernova billions of years ago. Um, and so, you know, when you th when you, when you look at like how property came to exist in the first place, uh, it was not at all subtle about it being a violent taking from the rest of people. I mean, that, you know, you just read some history going back, you know, as far as 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 history goes. And it's just one uh, group of people conquering and killing the other group and taking their land, you know, and often enslaving their the, the population. Uh, 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 and that, you know is how property uh, came to be in this country. There was a, you know, there were, there were people living here. Some of them had sort of like quasi territorial systems, but nothing like a modern property register, uh, you know, sort of collective ownership, you might say. Um, but then we came in, we killed all those people and we set up, you know, on almost all of the, of the land, uh, a, a system of, of, of property. And it's just built from the foundation uh, the politics of of raw violence, the sword and the club, you know what what property is and what it always has been is you set up a, a, a system where you say this is this is mine. And if you disagree, you try to take it from me, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to I'm going to uh, in, enjoin you in the courts or I'm going to get the police to come and drag you violently off of of my property. And so. Property is access to the state's uh, uh, violent capacity, to its police and its soldiers, you know, that you have a property register and, um, you know, you can you can access that. You can call 911 and you will get people to respond. You file a lawsuit and you get the state to respect your your lawsuit. Um, you know, that's not to say that that property is. Uh, 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 totally illegitimate all the time. You just have to recognize that it's a social construct. And in every case, it's at the root of dispossession, theft, violence, and genocide. 
And so, you know, the idea that it could be sacred is to me fairly disgusting. <laughs> you know, you should you should use it on behalf, in my view, on behalf of the general welfare of all the people. And, and, and I want to get to that concept of it. I just want to hang here for a moment because this is also, you know, this um, this idea of a monopoly of force by the government being in um, direct contradiction to the notion of property rights like or, or having a problem with the monopoly of force being in contradiction to the notion of property rights that's a, that is a real problem for when libertarians if you dig a little like three inches down this is, becomes problematic for them and it's also fascinating because i've had um uh, uh what was i think it was walter block i think it was who was on who um when when i was like if you start to just go back in terms of property rights they start the idea of property rights start not necessarily with the constitution in this country but more when europeans came over and started to work the land and that's where we're going to start where would property rights begin <laughs> and which is very convenient um like it's you know more or less like uh, i don't know getting to the top of a you know a sports game and then saying like you know uh, the the rules you know uh i'm the best right-handed batter so for now on we're only going to include right-handed batters yeah. in the stats uh and i'm in charge of it and that's basically basically it or something to that effect Okay, so that was a nice little uh, clip that allows me to segue into a deeper discussion of property. Um, because what you got in that clip wasn't very deep. Uh, had a lot of truth to it, but it doesn't really build the case as well as it could be built. So... If you go to the beginnings of anarchism, and this is uh, also basically at the beginnings of socialism, uh, the first great anarchist text that gets referenced is Pierre Joseph Proudhon's What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government. It's 242 pages. You could find it at the Anarchist Library. It was written in 1840. 1840. Okay, if you think about what was going on in 1840, this is like the beginning of industrialization. So you had challenges already from socialists and from the first anarchists to the very concept of property itself and its legitimacy as a legal construct. Um, and if you will just look at the table of contents real quick, because the next thing I'm going to do is read a short review of the book because uh, it's better written than anything I've written. And honestly, it's been like 20 years since I've read this. So, you know, he starts off talking about the methods that he uses. And then he goes into a very long discussion about what the philosophical arguments at the time were that justified the concept of property. Uh and someone in the chat said, yes, that was the book when he first said that he was an anarchist. Yes, that is correct. Um, uh, so then uh, if you recall from the clip, Sam Cedar is talking about how the Europeans had the concept of uh, land and labor being mixed together as sort of the foundation of what could be considered a claim or a right to property. So in chapter three, Prudhon uh, goes on and critiques that whole point of view. And uh, then in chapter four, he goes even deeper into the arguments about property and discusses how 
property really isn't even possible. And he gives some arguments which we're used to associating with Karl Marx and communism, but um, he is, uh, this is before Marx wrote any of that. And it's also in, in the context of criticizing the socialists that came before Prudhomme, which was Saint Simon and, uh, um, oh, what's his, well, well, the other guy, we'll get into it later, but they, their idea of socialism was basically this idea of creating these utopias, which is why it was called utopian socialism later by Marx and Engels. Uh, but the idea was for them was that you'd have a very technocratically managed and authoritarian uh, society where resources and industry were planned um, uh, from the top down. It, so the earliest socialist thinkers there were not, uh, the other guy was Fourier. They were not uh, trying to create a society where everybody had a voice and a say-so in the way that production happened. Uh, instead, what they were proposing were basically like perfect little society, perfect little communes that everything would function smoothly because they were technocratically planned. So this is who Prudhomme was critiquing. And... Uh, then anyway, so he ends in chapter five talking about psychological expositions of the idea of justice and injustice and uh, determination of the principle of government and of right, as in rights or who has the right to something, right? So it's a full-fledged anarchist critique and uh, something that's interesting, which we're going to go into in the next feature, is he even talks about the moral sense of man and the animals. So... You even see a little bit of a um, prelude to Kropotkin's later, uh, more ecological construction of anarchism. So, okay, so it's 164 pages in print, 242 in the PDF. And, I mean, it's amazing how many people want to critique anarchism, um, as being fundamentally anti-state when the first major text uh, is not just anti-state, but it's also against the idea of property as a legal construct. So we'll get more into that later, right? Anyway, I recommend everybody read this. The language is going to be slightly difficult and strange to us in 2022 because back in 1841, Prudhomme's using a lot of this like Enlightenment era language. Uh, let me see if I could find an example real quick. You know, like he's formally addressing people and he's, you know, just the way he uses the term right is going to sound strange. But I'm telling you, if you stick with it uh, and you get through the text, you're going to have a much better understanding of what anarchists have really been on about for a few hundred years now. So let's get into the review. This is by Anarcho, uh, same person who's the one of the large contributors to an anarchist fac. And uh, really, I, I think a lot of the work he has done has been very focused on Prudhomme. So he's always a good resource to go to for all things Prudhomme. And I'm just going to read this because it's not very long. And it's going to cover a lot of stuff that I would kind of glaze over and not put well myself. All right. So Prudhomme's work is a classic for many reasons. Not only did it put a name to a tendency within socialism, quote, I am an anarchist and raise a battle cry against inequality. Property is theft. It also sketched a new free society, anarchy. Prudhomme's work is a classic for many reasons. Not only, oh, yeah, it just repeats that. The bulk of the book contains Prudhomme's searing critique of property. This rests on two key concepts. Firstly, 
property allowed the owner to exploit its user, quote, property is theft. Secondly, that property created authoritarian social relationships between the two, quote, property is despotism. These are interrelated as it is the oppression that property creates which ensures exploitation while the appropriation of our common heritage by the few gives the rest little alternative but to agree to the domination and let the owner appropriate the fruits of their labor. The notion that workers are free when capitalism forces them to seek employment was demonstrab demonstrably false. Quote, we who belong to the proletarian class, property excommunicates us. Unquote. Proudhon's genius and the power of his critique was that he took all of the defenses of and apologies for property and showed that, logically, they could be used to attack that institution. So just a brief note there. So he's, in the text, he is taking someone like Locke and their argument for property and turning that argument on its head and showing how the very same argument can be used against property. That's what Anarcho is trying to say here. Okay, so for example, to those who argued that property was required to secure liberty, Proudhon rightly objected that, quote, if the liberty of man is sacred, it is equally sacred in all individuals, that if it needs property for its objective action, that is, for its life, the appropriation of material is equally necessary for all. His, unquote, his critiques of the various rationales for property still hold true, showing how the defenders of property had to choose between self-interest and principle, between hypocrisy and logic. He contrasts property with possession, and this is very important. The former being the right to use something by his neighbor's labor, unquote. Property results in the farmer toiling for a landlord or the worker producing for a capitalist. Possession is when those who use a resource control it. The worker in a cooperative or the self-employed artisan. Now remember, this is before industrialization got anywhere near what it is today. Okay. So only the former creates the exploitation of man by man and authoritarian social relationships. This, he argues, is cause of capitalism's inequality and crises. The contradictions, quote, property is impossible, inherent in a system in which workers are exploited by owners. Long before Karl Marx, Proudhon argued for a scientific socialism and that workers produced a surplus value. You'll, so just to pause again, you're going to see a lot when social, when Marxists criticize anarchists, they say that anarchists don't actually understand value uh, and value creation and don't understand surplus value, which is ridiculous because uh, Proudhon, even in this early work, already was talking about that. Okay, let's go back to it. The word he used was aubain, translated as usual as increase. Here's another example of how the language is strange, uh, which is appropriated by their boss. Here's a long quote. Whoever labors becomes a proprietor. And when I say proprietor, I do not mean simply, as do our hypocritical economists, proprietor of his allowances, his salary, his wages. I mean proprietor of the value he creates and by which the master alone profits. The laborer retains, even after he received his wage, a natural right in the thing he has produced. Okay, so what he's saying is the typical argument uh, that the laborer is not paid for the full value of what he produces. But uh, the argument's actually more complicated than that, and uh, we'll see if it touches on this. If not, I'll go into it more. Okay. So the capitalist also unjustly appropriates the additional value produced by joint activity. This is actually what I was getting to. Produced by joint activity. So while the boss paid all the individual forces, the collective force still remains to be paid. 
I'm going to stop right there. And I want to talk about this notion of collective force, right? So Prudhomme's argument is not just that me as an individual worker, uh, that I'm individually not paid, you know, for the entire value of the commodities that I produce. What Prudhomme is arguing is actually more interesting. He's saying that when you combine all of the workers, including me, you get more value than you would get if you just had one person uh, doing the task. Uh, even if that one person had, um, you know, an indefinite amount of time to complete the project, right? So uh, to give a concrete example, right, let's say it was an auto factory and, uh, uh, you know, every auto worker is paid an individual wage, but uh, together what they produce, the cars, uh, are more valuable than any single one of those uh, workers was paid individually, right? So um, the question then becomes, well, who should get um, who should get paid for that difference? But uh, the difference being what the collective force produces. Should it be the owner of capital or should it be the workers uh, collectively? And what Prudhomme is saying is that the system of property uh, in place was that the, the owner of the company is the one that had the right to that surplus that was created and could only be created through the combination of individuals when uh, it doesn't make any sense really because, um, uh, you know, if you're paying people individually, uh, yeah, it's going to look like you might be paying them adequately, even though if you flip that around and you look at what the company is making from the collective um, production of the products, there's a surplus, right? And the company is the one that gets to pocket that surplus. Okay, so let's go back to the text. Um, so the free worker produces 10. For me, thinks the proprietor, he will produce 12. And so to satisfy property, the laborer must first produce beyond his needs. Ha! <laughs> um, Thus, exploitation occurs within the workplace thanks to the worker having sold and surrendered his liberty to the proprietor. Interestingly, oh, great, now the art, it's going to get into it. Okay, interestingly, Prudhomme argues that as a result of collective force, all property becomes collective and undivided. Thus, his analysis of exploitation within production is used to inform his vision of a free society. So if we really seek liberty for all, we need to abolish property. Again, not possession. Uh, quote, if the right to life of life is equal, if the right of life is equal, the right of labor is equal, and so is the right of occupancy, unquote. Property must be socialized for just as the traveler does not appropriate the route which he travels, so the farmer does not appropriate the field which he sows, and all accumulated capital being social property, no one can be its exclusive proprietor. Okay, so workers' self-management must replace la wage labor as managers, quote, must be chosen from the laborers by the laborers themselves, unquote. So uh, in the beginning of anarchism, you already see that Prudhomme is arguing for the workers electing their own managers, right? must be chosen from the laborers by the laborers themselves. Uh, so, you know, going back uh, to a few episodes ago in that critique of uh, the Marxist left review, you know, one of the things they're saying, they're glossing over this idea of councils uh, being an anarchist idea, but it's already at the beginning of anarchist the workers electing their own management is a council. Anyway, okay. So in short, quote, those who do not possess today are proprietors by the same title as those who do, who do possess. 
But instead of inferring that property should be shared by all, I demand, in the name of general security, its entire abolition. Unquote. Only collective ownership and management ensures workers are not exploited, not to mention liberty for all rather than a few for, whether on the land or in industry, the aim was to create a society of possessors without masters. Unquote. Prudhomme's vision of a society based on possession, free access, use rights, has led some to suggest that he favored small-scale property. This is not the case. Although what is property, he all, all through what is property, he argues for social common ownership of the means of production. The, quote, land is indispensable to our existence. Consequently, it is a common thing. Consequently, insusceptible of appropriation. All capital, whether material or mental, being the result of collective labor is, in consequence, collective property. Okay, so that actually extends the argument uh, made earlier even further because when you zoom out and uh, you're not just looking at how the individual is compensated for their labor in a firm and you look at the whole of society and the way that production generally relies on this collective surplus that is produced by the entire working class, uh, then you see the bigger picture that it is a very small percentage of society, in other words, the people who own capital, who get to reap the rewards of the collective surplus, uh, the fruits of everybody's labor in society. Uh, which is the extension of that collective force argument. Okay. So this may be lost in Prudhomme's forceful critique of community, uh, because he does also... Okay, anyway, as usual, the term community, la communauté, is here translated as communism. This causes problems, as the ideas Prudhomme was critiquing were that of utopian socialist saint Simon and Fourier, these argued for highly regulated communities run by industrial chiefs where income was dependent on both labor and the amount invested in the project. While his critique was prescient as regards centrally planned state communism, it does not apply to libertarian communism, particularly as Prudhomme explicitly argues, like Prudhomme, for socializing land and the means of production. Rejecting, like later anarchists, both capitalism and state socialism, he called for a synthesis of communism and property, a union which will give us the true form of human association. This third form of society, he stated, we will call liberty. Um... Someone in the chat said they'd be tuning in tomorrow at one for the event. There shouldn't be anything scheduled for tomorrow, but this will be available. Just want to make that clear. And also, hello. Uh, significantly, Prudhomme procla Prudhomme's proclamation for anarchy was embedded in his discussion of why second effect of property is despotism. Thus, anarchist anti-statism is inherently bound up with its anti-capitalism, they're two sides of the same coin, and has always been so. He was well aware that property violates equality by the rights of exclusion and increase, and freedom by despotism, while anarchy was the absence of a master, of a sovereign. Proprietor was synonymous with sovereign, for he imposes his will as law and suffers neither contradiction nor control. It is the land lord for a reason. Thus, property is despotism, as each proprietor is sovereign lord within the sphere of his property, and so freedom and property were incompatible. His argumentation for anarchy in the book's final chapter followed discussion of animal sociability. This is remarkable in its topicality as modern biology, in the form of reciprocal altruism, has drawn remarkably simply conclusions in its discussions of both the evolution of ethics, not to mention the obvious links of both to Kropotkin's equally vindicated mutual aid. 
from his analysis of the social social nature of animals and humans, from the feelings of justice that produces, Proudhon drew the conclusion that the society of the future would be in anarchy. As with the economy, association is the social form of a free society of equals, or to use a more modern term, self-management. While federalism is not explicitly mentioned, Proudhon does so over a decade later, it is implied in his critique of communism. If you reject the centralized control of property in utopian communities, you would hardly support a centralized social structure. And this is what strikes the reader, namely, how much of later revolutionary anarchist and Marxist thought is contained in this classic from 1840. While we can quibble over certain aspects of his presentation, which he subsequently improved upon, and reject his repulsive patriarchal bigotries as irrelevant and in contradiction to his other ideals, the fact is that Proudhon defined what anarchism is, libertarian socialism, laying the foundation of later libertarians like Bakunin and Kropotkin uh, built upon. Okay, I'm just going to stop reading there. All right, so that is the classic, the most classic take on property that... Uh, that anarchists have. Um, and you could hear in that text, as I read it, a lot of uh, what the guy on um, the majority report was saying as well. Uh, I don't know who that was. I didn't look it up. Probably was an anarchist because I've not really heard many non-anarchists make those kind of arguments unless there's some sort of like market socialist or some other kind of anti-authoritarian Marxist. Uh, however, I'm not done with this topic of property because I don't think even Proudhon's discussion of property goes deep enough. As an existentialist, I'm interested in the phenomenology of property. I'm interested in what is the experience of property? What is it about our uh, the way we exist in the world that uh, that any kind of following concept of property rests on. So what's at the foundations in our experience that make the notion of property possible? And so this is something that Jean-Paul Sartre talks about already uh, from an existentialist perspective in his classic work, Being in Nothingness, uh, in his chapter, um, it's a whole section, I think it's section four on being, having, and doing, and he goes into what the ontological and phenomenological, uh, what he believes are the sources of this notion of property that we have, um, and then uh, if you want to go in a less deep direction with that, Eric Fromm wrote a short book called Having and Being. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's similar to Sartre. They are talking about the difference between existing and the mode of existing, which we think of as having or possessing. So it's a, so if you examine what it is to possess or to have something or another, which is the foundation of what any notion of property can be built on. What, what you wind up realizing is that it involves some sort of, uh, relationship between the ego or the self and something uh, you know, whatever it is in the world that is supposed to be the property, right? So the problem with that is that if you're an existentialist, uh, the ego is something that you only become, you on, you're, that only becomes a thing uh, when you start reflecting on your experiences. But before the act of reflecting on your experiences, there is no ego. Um, and, and in a very similar way to what might be a Western Buddhist 
notion. Uh, there is no self in the pre-reflective uh, mode of consciousness. There is um, a, just a continuous, non-positional consciousness that is also conscious of what it's conscious of, which is a deep thing. I'm not going to get into all of that. But so what happens is that once we start thinking about our experience in the mode of knowledge, in the mode of knowing, and start to uh, form concepts about what I am or the I, the ego is, and what the way that we divide up everything else in the world objectively as being basically uh, instruments. Uh, we look at things instrumentally as being things that we need in order to accomplish our goals is the way that Sartre says that consciousness uh, takes up um, uh, the, the world of things in themselves. Um, then you can have some sort of idea of property and possession, but ultimately it's doomed to failure because fundamentally, if there is no ego, then there also can't be any, uh, any relationship between ego and objects in the world that could come anything close to what we think of as property. And not only in this section of being in nothingness, but also um, when Sartre is talking about sadism and the mid and uh, the way that we interact with others, uh, he talks about this concept of possession as being uh, one of the ways that we try to fill in the void or the lack that we experience because we don't have an ego. And uh, although we, we exist in the world with things in themselves. Uh, and I realized that this might be going a little off the rails, so I'm going to dial it back there a little bit. But just keep in mind is that the notion that uh, phenomenologically or just like at the basic level of conscious experience um there's no ego so there can't really be any possession and attempts to possess things are really attempts to um give ourselves our own foundation when in fact we can't be the foundation for ourselves uh we have been thrown into this world and freedom is our quality of existence so there's a lot packed in there, and uh, so this is where uh, some of my ideas from an existentialist anarchist uh, come from, is this section of being in nothingness. However, I also think that um, uh, property can also be thought of as an identity, which is sort of saying the same thing, but if you read Sartre, he's not so much talking about it in the sense of identity, he's talking about it in the sense of possession. And I think that the, the more relatable experience that people have when they think about their property is really the experience of an identification between themselves and whatever it might be, whether it's land or their home or their car or whatever it is, it's a sense of extended self. Um, and there's a bunch of literature about how uh, a notion of extended self functions, but this would be sort of like the phenomenological analysis of what concepts of property are tapping into in our experience. However, and this is the key thing, and this is what we're going to get to uh, now that we've laid that groundwork, is that ultimately property isn't anything uh, like a, a category that's supposed to describe our experiences. Property is a legal category, and it is a legal fiction that is fully established through the history of 
uh, Western law. And a great book on that topic is Katharina Pistor's work, The Code of Capital, which I happen to be reading right now. Uh, so I'm not all the way through it, but what it does, which you don't, I haven't found this in any anarchist work. I haven't found this in any Marxist work. Uh, there is some really good work on primitive accumulation that this guy Paralamin wrote called the, uh, Um, uh, anyway, it's a, a book he wrote on primitive accumulation, which would, in other words, be the, uh, the terminology is a little weird, but primitive accumulation is just a way of saying what were the first forms of property and capital uh, in the history of uh, any given society that were then built upon later by the people who owned it? So in other words, how did people get land and other natural resources, which we know is historically through conquest? And anyway... That's a very different thing than what uh, Pistor is arguing in this book, because Pistor is a legal, a legal expert. And what she is doing is she's looking at the history of the legal codification of property and how those codes changed uh, since the Middle Ages. If we're talking about common law, uh, British common law and how um you know, initially, property wasn't, you know, when you were still in the, these feudal time periods, only the sovereign, which would be the king, you know, etc., cetera, uh, owned anything, owned any land. Um, everyone else just basically had uh, various rights to use it, but no one was given that exclusionary power uh, legally to own it. And this is what has changed, uh, especially after the revolutions in the United States and Europe, where the legal structures over time uh, started giving more and more rights of uh, to creditors and to the owners of capital uh, to property. And how that sets the stage for capitalism. And it's a really, really good book. And what it demonstrates so clearly is that for all of the like high level philosophical Lockean arguments um, that one might make to defend capital or defend property, the actual legal history of property, uh, the, the real uh, way that property has been encoded into law and protected by governments, national governments, um, just doesn't, doesn't look anything like that. And, um, and yeah, it's a great book. I would recommend reading it. So... As far as property is really concerned uh, in the way that it exists in the world, it's as it's a legal construct. And there is not just one kind of property. If you look at property law, uh, it's very complicated. You have to be dedicated to it in order to fully comprehend all the minutia of property law. But, you know, when you're talking about differences between aboriginal title or absolute right to property or, uh, you know, uh, who has priority when property rights are disputed and all of these different things that over the past few hundred years have been established uh, as laws, 
you finally get to what we have today, which maybe the term capitalism doesn't even fit because it's really the legal structure that has been built to favor the people who the aristocrats and those who owned land initially uh, to exclude uh, those who um, they were arguing their claim to land for, which was the commoners, right? So uh, before you had the institute, before land was able to be traded as a commodity and sold, you weren't allowed to sell land. Um, and some of that land was designated as being common property for the peasants. But eventually, you know, uh, the lords decided that they wanted to enclose the commons, which means they wanted to get rid of common property so that land could be put on the market and land could be bought and sold uh, speculatively. And this is, that's the beginning, that's the real beginning of capitalism, in my opinion. And then when things, uh, when industrialization really starts kicking off, that's, you know, one of the next giant questions is, okay, you have these machines and these factories that are capable of um, mass production. Who should own them? Because the people who wound up owning them well, they bought the, those machines uh, by taking out loans from banks, you know, uh, so they didn't build them. And uh, the people who worked the machines and produced the things, you know, none of that stuff was uh, uh, had anything to do with the labor of the people that wound up owning the industrial factories. And, you know, it's really hard to say. Uh, from any kind of like logical or moral standpoint that the people who wound up owning the factories really had a right to them. And this is why you had so many revolutions all throughout Europe uh, and so many people became anarchists and Marxists because they the majority of society just never even had a chance. Property laws were written to exclude them from the beginning of uh, the nation state system and developing over time from that beginning, especially if you were indigenous, uh, you know, you were excluded from uh, really participating in the, in the market. Right. So, uh, you know, there's been bullshit and bullshit and bullshit offered by capitalists over time about how, well, if you work hard enough, then you can be incorporated uh, or assimilated into this uh, small portion of society who are the owners of capital. You eventually might be able to earn enough money through smart investment and savings to become a capitalist yourself. But, you know, it's been long enough to see that that just isn't what happened. Uh, most people are not owners of capital and are not able to invest in any kind of serious projects. They're not really, they're not landowners. They can't produce their own food. They can't do any of the things that were taken for granted uh, for most of human history when it comes to uh, your ability to be autonomous and be able to, you know, feed your own, own family and things like that. So, so that's what property is. It doesn't make sense at a phenomenological level and legally, uh, you know, the same arguments that can be used for it can be used against it. And the history of the legal codifications demonstrate that it has nothing to do with any kind of concept of justice and much more to do with who the victors have been in imperial conquest.